welcome to the 12th episode of the sixth season of the Ubuntu podcast. In this episode, we're going to talk to Rick Spencer about Ubuntu engineering. We've got another time-saving tip, have we, in Command Line Love? Yes, we have. Okay. And we'll read your feedback. If you're listening live, you can send us messages using the chat facility on the website and in the IRC channel. I'm Alan, and joining me is Laura. Hello. And Mark. Hello. Uh, oh, crikey. <laughs> and Tony. Hello. Oh dear. I don't know. <laughs> Sounds like a barbershop quartet. <laughs> I'm not doing it. <laughs> um, so, Laura, what have you been up to? It's my birthday. And you'll oh, cry today? if you want to. Is it today? No, no, it was at the weekend. Okay. But yeah. we just finished the cake. We did, and a delightful cake it was too. Did you make it? Mm, no. Well, was it from a locally sourced food supplier? <laughs> Hey, sort of. <laughs> that was a particularly evil. It depends out. where you mean local too. <laughs> it came on public transport. <laughs> it did. Uh, yeah. Yes. What have you been up to then? We went to uh, BFI Day at Doctor BFI Doctor Who Day oh, in London Doctor again. Who, Doctor Who. Who'd have thought? Yes, it was very good though. It was very good, and actually, I'll get to you in a minute, Tony. <laughs> and the actual story was one that I actually enjoyed watching. <laughs> well, okay. the other well, bit. Mm. Which, which era? Uh, Fifth Doctor, so Peter Davidson. Oh right. So yes. Oh. You, you can hear what we thought of it on the Facebook version of the Doctor Who podcast, Gosh. which you can find at the Doctor Who Podcast dot com. <laughs> That's about enough of that. Yeah, we did put, put the EUPC on there as well. I should hope oh, so. Did you? Yeah. Well, I mean, none of them knew what you were talking about. Did they? They've listened to one episode. Have they? Yeah. No oh, idea what we talked was it, about. Was it one where you talked all about Doctor Who? No. no okay. <laughs> How about you, Mark? What have you been up to? Oh, um, not a lot, really. I'm afraid. Oh. How about you? Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I've just realised your entry and this is blank. Yes. Yes. What about you, Tony? Um, well, I went to see the Reduced Shakespeare Company doing their Complete Works of Shakespeare Abridged show, which they're touring around the UK at the moment. Go uh, and it, see it. Yes, it was very good. And how, how long do they take to do the whole Works of Shakespeare? It's about an hour and a half. Wow. With an interval. So, um, yeah, it's under two hours in total. It's brilliant. It's very funny, and I got to go up on stage and run around like a fool. Um, I've seen the show three times in about 20 years. Um, and it's it's very good. Is it different people every time? Or? Yeah, different cast members. Although the, one of the people who is performing it at the moment, I saw 15 years ago in the same part. Gosh. <laughs> um, yes, who's Matt Rippey, who played the Captain Jack Harkness in Torchwood. God, Doctor Who yeah. again? Who recognised me from Twitter, which is... <laughs> yeah, he went, Tony, across the fire. Yeah, which implied wow. that might be a bit stalky. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure I came off well from that. But yeah. no, it's, it's very nice. They're very nice guys. Yes. Um, yeah. Go see it. Yeah. Excellent. Cool. Have you done anything, Alan? Um, I went to uh, San Francisco, Oakland, for a canonical sprint. Oh, cool. And I watched... Um, Django Unchained on the plane on the way out there. Is that like a Python development? No. <laughs> I think you find it's Django Unchained. No. Uh, it's a Tarantino film. And then I watched it again on the way back. That's well, cool. And I suddenly Was have good? a bit of a crush on Christoph Waltz. <laughs> <laughs> the, guy, the German guy in the film who's absolutely excellent. Cool. Mm. Wow. That's good. <laughs> Should we get on with the show? Yeah, yeah I, I think we're better before Alan needs to lie down. <laughs> on the line now, we have uh, Rick Spencer, who's VP of Ubuntu Engineering, live from Seattle. Hey, Rick, how are you doing? I'm doing well. Thanks, Alan. Good, good. We, we last spoke to you back in um, April 2010 at uh, UDS in Brussels, and you were all about Quickly, and Mark had just announced Unity in his keynote. And um, So how have the last three oh. years been? <laughs> uh, well... Um... Super great. Yeah, it's been great. I was actually thinking about that because I remember um, 10, 10, 10 stood for 42, and that was my age then, and now I've reached a big round number. <laughs> 43. 
<laughs> well yeah. done, well done, Tony. Yeah. So last week, um, Still going strong. <laughs> we had a we had a canonical sprint, and um, Jono blogged afterwards that there's 150 people who are focused on phone and tablet. How does that How does that affect what we're doing for Ubuntu desktop? Um. Well, oh, that's an interesting question. So right now, Ubuntu Desktop and Ubuntu Touch are separate things, separate code bases. But our vision is that they'll converge into the same code base. So um, what we are working on now, what we'll be discussing at Virtual UDS next week, what we'll be delivering for Ubuntu Touch in 13.10 should all form the basis of you know, a common code base, uh, we're hoping like as early as the 1404 release. So, so when so you say, it up very much, when you say that they're going to, there's going to be a common code base, are you talking about the, the desktop moving towards what we're starting to see from the phone and tablet rather than the phone and tablet moving to be more like what we're used to with the desktop? Well, um, Gee, I'm not sure how to answer that, but I will say we, we think it's going to be easier to scale up from a more mobile-oriented mm-hmm. OS than to run on desktops at the you know kernel plumbing level than to take the desktop and scale it down to run on a phone mm-hmm. you know at the kernel and plumbing level. So what we're hoping is that as we put in Ubuntu Touch in the place, that then uh, adding all the features at the UI level that you need for a desktop, that'll go quickly, we hope. So you said we're hoping to have convergence by as early as 14.04. So that means we've got another release, Saucy Salamander 13.10, which will be what a, a, an update in the same way that 13.04 was. How, what, what are you thinking 13.10 is going to look like? Well... I was real. I'm really pleased with 1304. I think it's a very sublime release. You know, Unity, even on my very small netbook, is running very smoothly. And during the whole ra- raving s- cycle, like you could use 1304 every day. So our daily quality was really good, and I think it really showed in our release. Um, so I'm hoping for more of the same in that in 1310. However, I think a lot of the things that we've put into place for Ubuntu Touch, we'll start to move over for 13.04. So I think it'll be maybe have more changes or at least more options um, than 13.04. Like one thing that I'd really like the desktop team to shoot for is to have an optional session that you can install in 13.10 and choose to log in into an Ubuntu Touch session instead of a traditional desktop session. Right. So would that be using Mia or would that just be using the, the standard X that, that we've already ha- already got on 13.10? Well, I'd like it to use Mir, you know, just to be a Ubuntu Touch session running on the desktop. But I don't think we'll have time to go and add all the features that you would need in a GUI for the desktop. Right. So that's why it would be optional. Like, I don't think you'll get a workspace switcher and, and that kind of thing, you know. Um, so I think... What I want is for 13.10 to be as stable and fast as 13.04, but there, there to be a bunch of new things to try, even if they're not available by default. How do you prioritize the amount of development effort that goes into the desktop versus um, you know, the, the mobile platform? Um, well, we're really, because like ultimately we see them as the same code base, we're pushing really hard on Ubuntu Touch right now. So that's really the priority right now. Is that a way of saying not much is going to go into the desktop for a while? Well, no, we can't really say that because when you ask me, you know, how I prioritize, well, you know, there's only part of the Ubuntu community that works for Canonical and works for me. So there's a lot of people who are doing still innovative things um, in 13.10 on the desktop. So I think that you know, even if you just consider the upstreams that we get, that we sync to every cycle, there'll be a lot of changes there. But there'll be, you know, still a lot of community members who pour, are pouring their heart and soul into the desktop. So um, I think there'll be, you know, a lot of contributions to the desktop. For my team, you know, not much might be a f- fair way of putting it. But there's still just a lot of 
turning the crank to make a distro. It just takes a lot of work, even if you don't do a lot of new things, just to keep it running every day. And in that um, regard, talking about the amount of work, there was a, a subject you brought up at the last uh, during the last cycle, which was that of uh, possibly going to a rolling release. Now, that didn't seem to um, complete in the way that you saw that vision would pan out. Um, do you think that's adversely affected the way 1304 has turned out, having that whole conversation? and um, Or do you think it was good to get that out? out in the open or how do you how do you feel about that that whole conversation yeah no i don't i don't think it had an adverse effect on 1304 as as what the the product was so um well obviously i think a rolling release between lts's is the right way to go that's what i think you know as one person in the Ubuntu community, I think that we should release an LTS as we do now and then have a rolling release in between where the rolling release is, a, is good and usable every single day, you know. Um, so um, I put that out there and I, I kind of wanted to push harder on it. But, you know, when I put it out there, some feedback, there were some things I didn't expect that, you know, switching to a rolling release, especially suddenly, had some impacts on parts of the community, which just made it improper to just do it. You know, like when you looked at the flavors, you know, the um, Zubuntu's and Lubuntu's, like their mission is to, to ship a stable version of their upstream desktop experiences. And it, it was would have been hard for them to do um, had we just suddenly switched to a rolling release, right. you know? Yeah. So that was just, it just wasn't the right, it wasn't the right time for reasons that I, you know, that I, 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 I hadn't foreseen. So On the you, other hand, some people, Oh, sorry, go ahead. Do you think there would be a right time maybe after the next LTS to revisit this topic? Well, yeah. I mean, I don't want to, for, for my part, I don't, think we should drop it we should keep talking about it but you know it is just one option we're a pretty big community and it's not this isn't the kind of thing that like one person just gets gets to decide you know what i mean like right and with uds coming up where those kind of discussions happen um we've got that coming up next week what what are you hoping to get out of uds um well that's a good question so we we so first of all, we recently switched it to a virtual UDS. And, um, you know, I was counting, like, just in, like, the number of managers, leads, and architects that are work for Canonical and contribute to Ubuntu. And there's, like, 35 of them. And over the last few years, we had really, like, upped our planning game and had been doing a lot of continuous planning. And so we were finding waiting like every six months to get back to a UDS to have good discussions with community members, maybe people who didn't have enough time to be doing that continuous planning. It was just like too long to sync. So we'd been looking for ways to be more transparent with our continuous planning. And it seemed like a virtual UDS that um, was every three months could help address that, like just to have more frequent sync points. And also we had a lot of feedback from people, especially like people who are like key to certain upstreams that um, they'd be like important for certain conversations, but they didn't want to travel to like Copenhagen for just like one hour or something, right. you know? And so, um, so we're trying virtual UDS. I think we learned a lot from the first one. How do you feel that went? How, are you are you confident about the next one? And do you think we'll carry on doing them every three months or review or what? Well, yes and no. I mean, I think I think it went well for what it was. One thing is we did have a lot of backup of planning to discuss. So I was pretty aggressive about forcing one really like soon, which which left a lot of people flat footed, you know, they didn't really have time to change their plans and participate, but it was sort of a, 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 a choice between that and to having all these plans that we were going to start working on and not doing that transparently. 
So I think this this next one should go better because people have had a lot more lead time to plan around it, and then we've got better at the tools. But I am getting a lot of feedback that just like the lack of face-to-face in-person interaction is a really painful loss. And so it's not – so I think while virtual UDS has um, – is going to address some of the the, the – um, the issues that have come up with the fact that we're planning so much faster and so much more frequently, I still think we'll need to figure something out for that face-to-face interaction part. So maybe we maybe we need to have um, a water cooler or corridor hangout where people just go in between sessions and you know bump into people virtually. Sure. Yeah. Or maybe have other reasons to get better. I mean, I've been thinking about ways to get UDS back to its roots, where it's you know more low-key engineers working with engineers it had had gotten to be a pretty big event you know yes with with sort of keynotes from mark and announcing new ideas and new directions and things um certainly my experiences at at some of the uds i guess four years ago five years ago were much more about uh you know as you say developers and getting people in a room together and chatting and coming up with those ideas in the first place rather than announcing them yeah. Well, again, that gets back to just the fact that we're just so much better at planning than we were. You know, my first UDS, I spent like every day in the same room with the desktop team um, every hour of every day. And we were, you know, that was all the planning that we had done uh, for the previous six months and for the next six months. And so um, just the, the scope of the project has grown. That's just just not enough. You know, we can't wait wait six months for that so yeah it's changed it's changed a lot like uh in that regard so it's one one topic that's that's come up very recently just today in fact uh colin watson's introduced the world to click packages on the ubuntu devil list um is that the future of ubuntu packaging um i know i don't think it is the future first of all this is it's it's funny um topic because i remember talking to to michael to mvo about this like way back in the day like so this has been something that's been specified in brewing for some number of years um i think uh it's you know what's changed is like someone's actually going to do something about it it looks like um so i think um there is a kind of package that is not totally amenable for for devs and i know as an application developer i struggled a lot with um with devs and making devs and it just seemed like a very complex solution to a simple problem so i think um now that we have like a really proper ubuntu sdk and the kind of apps that we're making now is the time for a packaging solution like this but at the end of the day there's still going to be complex packages and you know the debian format for the core operating system I just, you know, sure there's room for improvement, but I don't think that there's, it can be really replaced, you know. Right. So um, it's not a one size fits all for for everything. You you envisage like multiple different packaging scenarios in the future. Yeah, well, exactly. Well, I've been like kicking the tires a lot on the SDK, the Ubuntu SDK, and I've written a bunch of apps. And they're just a few QML files, really. And so for those, I think the click packages is a really great solution, especially in combination with the application installation work that the security team's been doing, right? So it's like you'll be able, user will be be able to easily get my QML files. Of course, they won't know their QML files. So get my application and then install it, and Ubuntu will be able to run them in a way that even if I try to make a malicious program. It, w- it wouldn't be able to execute in a malicious way. That's, um, that's quite a new way of thinking for us on on in the Linux desktop. It, it sounds very much more like the the kind of siloed approach that you get on on mobile platforms. Do you think that's us growing up a bit? Um, I don't know about growing up. Maybe I. Um, yeah, I. I don't know how to answer that question. It's <laughs> okay. Feel free not to. Well, we have... I feel like it's the right tool. It's the right solution given the the SDK that we have now. It's the right time. Well, we've just got time for one last question, and it's I think probably the most important one. Um, when are we going to be able to get our hands on a mobile phone running Ubuntu? 
Uh, well, we target um, the Nexus and the Nexus 4 as our reference platforms today. And um, we set a goal um, that by the end of May, that you could use that you could use Ubuntu Touch as your daily phone, which means it'll make and receive calls, it'll work with your contacts, it'll do a SMS, and you'll be able to get a web browser working over data. Um, so you should be able to do everything that you need to do. Um, uh, so I think what in, Tony actually means is when are you going to individually post him a phone? <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> Yeah, I th well, I thought the question I was avoiding was um, when, when can we you buy one, one in a store? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so when can we buy one in a store? <laughs> well, so, you know, one thing that Canonical does bring to the table is a team of very skilled and connected commercial people who know how to go talk to big companies and convince them to do crazy things and convince them to do smart things. So... Um, they're all working busily, but I think, bef you know, I think the first thing is that we have to get to 1310 and really make this Ubuntu touch and uh, do a great job with it. So let's, uh, I guess, um, I want to focus on our part first, which is to, to make, make the thing to sell, you know, but, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I would guess, I would hazard to guess that next year, you know, people will be buying Ubuntu phones. Cool. Look forward to it. Yes. Well, thank you very much indeed for taking some time to talk to us from all the way over there in Seattle. Cool. Hey, thanks a lot, guys. Really thanks, appreciate it. Cheers. Cheers. Thanks, Rick. Thank Cheers. you. Bye. Bye. And now it's time for some command line love. Ooh. Oh, yes. What's up this week? So there's a... Um, I, I may have mentioned this previously, but I use Vim for taking notes mm -hmm. uh, in text files. But I want Like them, everybody should. Exactly. Uh, but I want them to be on all my computers. So I put them in shared storage in Ubuntu One. So mm -hmm. they're synchronized. But some of them have got sensitive stuff in, so I want them encrypted. Um, you, you don't, don't trust, trust Ubuntu One with your data? <laughs> No, it's just that if it synchronizes to all my computers and I'm sat here at your house and someone <laughs> breaks into my house and steals my computer, there's a potential that they might see my stuff. Or Sophie just hacks you. Got out of that. <laughs> oh, got out of that quickly. Uh, mm. so, so I want to encrypt my stuff for whatever reason. Okay. Um, and I'd already created like a whole load of these notes, these text files, and I wanted to um, encrypt all of them at once. And I started, and I was using GPG. Yeah. And GPG is fairly good on the command line. I mean, there's, I'm sure there's GUI tools for it, but being this is command line love, I did GPG uh, minus minus encrypt star.txt, basically. Yeah. Uh, but that, that doesn't actually work. <laughs> um, you can't do them like that multiple. Uh, so I, I started writing a little script that did a loop, loop from like loop. for each file. And then I started running into trouble because each of the files, uh, some of them had spaces in the names and yeah. I had all sorts of trouble with my mm. script. And then I Googled a bit and I found that GPG actually has a command line option, dash, dash, multi-file. <laughs> multi-file. <laughs> does work with star.txt? Exactly. Ah. So... GPG dash dash multi file and star uh, minus minus encrypt star dot txt bosh. So you get and you this isn't creating like an encrypted archive of all of them. This is creating nope. an encrypted version of each. So if you've got a hundred text files in a directory, you run that command, you get a hundred encrypted text files in that directory. Cool. Plus your mm -hmm. original hundred text files. And so, so that people then... don't have to get through the encryption. Well, no. So I then, <laughs> and then I and then I, oh. once I did, once I guaranteed that I had encrypted them all by uncrypting one or two of them. I then deleted all star.txt. Job done. It was brilliant. I was so totally, uh, unbelievably happy about this that I didn't have to break out my bash scripting. And that's it. GPG dash dash multifile. It's excellent. Excellent. And it can decrypt. Uh, well, I don't need to. I'm sure it can. Right. But I don't need to. 
Okay. I'm but, sure it probably can. GPG minus minus decrypt. Oh, because you'd only decrypt individual files. Exactly. And because I use Vim and I've got a Vim plugin that automatically decrypts as I open the file, ah. Ah. that's and ah. re encrypts it as I save the file. I don't really care about doing them all on mass. So this was this only initial. For the files you already This had. was the initial <clears throat> encrypt everything that's in there so I don't have to go through and save each one encrypted. Cool. That is just brilliant. <laughs> And now it's time for some feedback. First up, uh, Nad- Nadri Majstor left a comment on our website. Can we have GNU slash Linux logos on www.ubuntu.com main page? I was quite successful getting my business environment accepted and using Ubuntu. However, when I try to communicate the idea that we should contribute something back, my bosses look at the main page and conclude that they're sitting on a pile of money and basically ignore me. To be fair, Mark Shuttleworth is sitting on a pile of money. Okay, he <laughs> is a guy. He is not Canonical or Ubuntu. Very true. And Canonical are not sitting on a pile of money. So um, Ubuntu.com needs to make it more obvious. Oh, we should just turn the page into something that looks like a GeoCities page from five years ago so that <laughs> so you know, no one actually, so we look like we're in poverty. You've got to get the businesses using the software. Yeah, the problem is that the... the, the the website needs to fulfil more than one requirement. And one requirement is, you know, we're now advertising our services to, you know, fairly large telecoms companies trying and carriers and trying to look professional. But at the same time, remember that we've got all these roots of um, community people and developers who've created stuff. And, you know, it's it's a difficult balance to to um, to master. Mm. Interestingly, mm. when this in, the email came in, about the and I saw a bit about the GNU Linux logos and after I'd thought for a bit and remembered what the GNU Linux logos actually were, Tux the Penguin and that GNU playing oh, yeah. recorder or whatever it is, I looked on all of the other distro websites that I could think of. So Red Hat, Suze, Fedora, um Mint, none of them have GNU Linux any reference to No, everyone Tux the Penguin. Every site has its own branding. Yeah. Um I mean we yes. We keep getting this meme that um, Ubuntu doesn't mention Linux anywhere on Ubuntu.com, and that's been said numerous times. Um, and actually, we do. If you click to Ubuntu.com and click About Ubuntu, uh, like the first line says Ubuntu is a Linux distribution or something like that. But I think we would there, there's there's we would have to keep on going down that road in order to please everyone. Mm. So, you know, there's it's a Linux distribution. Okay, well, you also need to mention all these other projects, and you mm. also need to have these logos, and you also need to have a copy of the, you know, GNU GPL and the and the FSF manifesto, and, you know, you cannot please everyone. But having those logos wouldn't show what he's wanting to show anyway, actually. No, I mean, if we, if we kept the website looking professional, clean, and polished, and then slapped a GNU playing a whistle <laughs> on, on the side. I, I don't think... Well, okay. If it could be done aesthetically, I still don't think it would make it us wouldn't... look like we needed the money. No, mm. it wouldn't... It wouldn't. You'd have to know what GNU Linux was, and if they're trying to convince a business environment to adopt Ubuntu in mm. the first place, chances are they wouldn't recognise what the logo means. I think it's a slightly contrived uh, scenario yeah. myself. I think probably the best way to support Canonical is to take out support contracts... For various versions of Ubuntu. Or when you download Ubuntu, you know. Yeah. But as a corporate, if you want to support. Oh, yeah, sorry. If you're, uh, yes, you're right. If you're yeah, a if corporate, give something back, then, then yeah. yeah, pay for a support contract. Yeah. Even like the lowest one where you get a few number of calls a year um, and you get to speak to our excellent support people in London or Montreal or wherever they are. Mm. Mm. They're worth every penny. They are. <laughs> They're lovely people. Okay. So Nad Rimmer Justor also asked... When will the Ubuntu webpage get community and documentation as one of the main categories? This is we discussed this we last, talk about the other this. week that it had been redesigned and mm-hmm. community had been bumped off in favour of phone, tablet, TV, and other links because yeah. the community site was being redone. Yes, and it will be restored once the community and site has been finished. Yeah, you know? and dear, uh, Daniel's been chasing everyone to try and get that finished, and uh, there's a, um, um, a mock-up or not a mock-up a, a preview 
beta draft. That's the word I'm looking for. <laughs> draft Bless. version. Oh, gosh. It's a beta. Was, no, it's just hard. a draft. Uh, there's a draft version of the site up. And, I mean, it's not even got a domain associated with it. If you know the IP address, you can go to it. <laughs> uh, because it's just for us to review it and make sure all the text is right. So we've been, like, making sure there's no grammatical errors and typos um, in the community team. Uh, uh, in Ubuntu, not just canonical people, but Ubuntu people have been contributing copy to that site and fixing errors and stuff. So, yeah, we're nearly there. Um, but, yeah, it's not a giant um, scheme to block the community <laughs> out. It's just the site wasn't ready. Stop, it's not ready yet. <laughs> I yeah, wonder exactly. where that would come in. As your <laughs> friend Christoph Waltz would say. <laughs> from Germany. Uh, Federico <laughs> from Argentina emailed to say... I heard you talking about how our benevolent dictator for life conceded that clockwise is the positive way. I'd like to mention a few <laughs> indisputable facts. In math, maths and trig <laughs> trigonometry, positive angles are measured anti-clockwise. Positive line integrals are the ones measured anti-clockwise. In Olympic competitions involving a circuit like running and cycling, the athletes go anti-clockwise the same happens with car horse and dog races so there seem to be contradictory signs on the matter and i was disappointed nobody raised any concerns about it in the last show shame on us all yeah yeah i'm fascinated where can you see a horse and a car and a dog racing each other? because <laughs> i want to go gear. there <laughs> excellent yes so different cultures have different interpretations of what's positive well, yeah, I mean, just he, has, he has a point. I mean, if you sit and think about it, I'm sure there are some things, you know, when cats lay down, they go around anti-clockwise before they sit down. You know, I'm sure there's loads of things that you could identify are one way or the other. I yes. now can't think of any positive ones other than a clock. That's why it's called clockwise. A uh, car wheel, when you're going forwards, it goes, it depends on which, which side. Which you're looking. Oh, look at the near side, it doesn't. If you're driving on the left. Right. <laughs> oh, man. Oh. Anyway. We asked for feedback on the last show. Jack Weird and tweeted, Needs more dishwashers <laughs> and cats and possibly cats washing dishes. Well, that would be a neat trick. You wouldn't need a dishwasher then. I know, it would save a lot of work, wouldn't yeah. it? Our cats do try to wash our dishes sometimes if we leave them long enough. Ah, <laughs> yeah, so do ours. That makes us sound they... disgusting, Laura. Is this yeah. them jumping in the sink and splashing around to try no, and clean the cat? No, if they leave them like three weeks on the side, then the cats, you know. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so, <laughs> from my being at university. That reminds oh, me. A friend who lives in New York in a little apartment so doesn't have space for a litter tray, they've actually trained their cat to wee in the toilet. And they put up a video to prove it. Wow. Wow, I'm not going to be so watching gonna that. I'm going to share that with you. It was very, very cool. Thanks for that, Laura. <laughs> and finally, Some value and finally cool. Avidius 2 has pointed out that Alan's crush, Christoph, Christoph Waltz, is in fact Austrian and not German. That doesn't diminish my love. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Shows it's not just superficial. Exactly. The Ubuntu podcast needs you. Yes, you. If you hear something that tickles, titillates or taunts you, tweet us at UUPC or email podcast at ubuntu-uk.org. You can also talk to us on the telephone, Skype, Facebook and Google+. Find links to all these places on our website, podcast.ubuntu-uk.org. We really would like to hear from you. So go on, do your duty, keep calm and compose an email. Is that a new one? I have a large number of them. Oh, wow. Looking says, forward to the rest. It says track seven, this one. Track seven of 3,800. <laughs> oh, with minor variations, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks all for listening. Uh, join us on Wednesday, the 22nd of May at 7.30 UTC. That's 8.30 UK time. In the for evening. our next live episode. <laughs> yes. Alan managed to convert 24 hour clock to 12 hour and not say PM. Yeah, because it's just sounded clumsy saying 1930 UTC or 2030 UTC. Fair enough. But it's now, I've done, now I've done that. Don't get confused. Right. Yes. Excellent. I'm sure that's clarified everything for everybody. <laughs> In two weeks' time from now, an there hour is a ago. countdown on our website which tells you. Yes. And it always works. Well, join us next time. <laughs> Thanks for listening. Bye Cheers. bye. Bye bye. bye.